Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate, of course, Jesus entering Jerusalem four days before His death and seven days before His resurrection. And when I read the Palm Sunday story, which I have, of course, many times, I always look through it through through this lens for some reason. I'm always moved by and continue to come back to the mix of desperation and hope expressed by the crowd that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. The Gospels tell us that he entered the city to the loud acclamation of a large and expectant crowd. If you read it closely, though, you will also see that they were desperate. Mark, in his Gospel, tells us that many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches, palm branches, they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So this word Hosanna, which the crowd shouted on that day, is literally a cry for help. It's a prayer for salvation. These people were quoting the 118th Psalm where uh, they prayed, where the Jewish people were looking forward to, and now these folks were praying for the Jewish Messiah to come and to save them. So part of the 118th Psalm reads like this, Lord, save us. Save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this prayer that was prayed on the first Palm Sunday was a desperate prayer and a hopeful prayer at the same time. Why? Because those who prayed it believed that Jesus was the answer to their prayer. They believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Son of David, sent by God to save them from the tyranny of Rome, to fix their broken nation and broken lives, to bring them peace that would never end. Of course, Jesus came to do even more than that. He came to save them from death to life, now and forever. And not just them, but everyone who believes in him. So I've come to believe that our Jewish brothers and sisters in that crowd on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, embodied the desperate hope of all humanity, all of us, each of us. Somehow, if we're honest, most human beings since the beginning of time have known that we need help, that something is broken about us and in us, and that we, in fact, need someone to fix us. We need saving We need a Savior. And I'm guessing that something inside of each of us, if we'll think about it, and again, if we'll be honest with ourselves, resonates with the passionate prayer of those people 2,000 years ago, which in effect said, fix me, help me, save me. So pardon the drama, but when I hear the words of the Coldplay song that Amanda just saying a few moments ago, I imagine the voice of Jesus saying, I will fix you. When you you look at the Palm Sunday story harmonized in all the Gospels, it's actually a long story with many facets. But I've always loved the way it's ended in the Gospel of Luke. It, 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 it ends like this in Luke's gospel, as he, as Jesus, approached Jerusalem. Now remember, he's, he's riding down from the Mount of Olives, which has this spectacular view of old city Jerusalem, if you've ever been there. He's riding down the Palm Sunday road, which some of us have walked together in a past trip to Israel, and he's looking at the city and riding in, in, in. So he sees this whole vista in front of him, and he's surrounded by this raucous crowd of people, you know, shouting, save us, and at the same time offering praises to him. And we're told by Luke that as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. 
and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. So surrounded by this crowd of people shouting and praying and praising him, Jesus cried. He wept. What he was about to do that week on Good Friday and Easter would bring the whole city, everybody in it, what they were looking for. But Jesus knew that most of them were going to miss it. I mean, there's a crowd surrounding him. It's a large crowd, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people in that city who would completely miss who he was and completely miss what he was coming to do and what he did. And he cries, if only you had known, he said, what I can do for you. He was there to fix them, and they missed it. But, but see, we do know. We have the privilege now of looking back 2,000 years and being aware of what it was that Jesus did on Holy Week, knowing what he did on Good Friday, knowing what happened on Easter Sunday morning. We know that Jesus did what was needed to be done in order to bring us peace with God and peace in this world, to make us right with God, to bring us life now and forever. We have the ability to look back and read you know, some of the words that were written about what Jesus did pretty soon after he did it, like by the Apostle Paul who wrote to the Romans and said, all are justified, or all, all are made right with God freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. See, we know that. We, we know that. Or we read the words of Paul to the Ephesians who tells us in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So we know what he came to do in a way that those folks on Palm Sunday couldn't have possibly understood. And we have the opportunity to make sure that we do not miss it. And I, I think that perhaps the reason that the Hosanna Save Me prayer of Palm Sunday has become now an expression of praise. I mean, typically when people, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you have any familiarity with Scripture or any familiarity with Christianity, Hosanna has become a word of praise. We don't think of it as a prayer. I think the reason that, the, that Hosanna has changed from being a, a prayer of desperation to a praise is, is because Jesus, in fact, did what needed to be done to save us. And, and because of the fact that all we need to do to receive that salvation is to believe the good news or the gospel about what Jesus did. And so we know, we're able to look back and understand what happened on Holy Week and what it offers to us. We know that Jesus lived a better life than we could ever possibly hope to live. In fact, he lived the perfect life, a life none of us could ever hope to live. He therefore qualified in the eyes of God the Father to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And then he entered death, and because of what he had done on the cross, and because sin's penalty had been paid, he defeated death. Death could not hold him. And we know, we know that when we believe in who Jesus is and on what Jesus did, then we are in fact saved. In fact, Paul wrote to the Romans and said, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, and confess it with your mouth, you are saved. So we've had the opportunity to be fixed, if you please. And we've had the opportunity to receive salvation, if you please. And therefore, for us, Hosanna isn't just a prayer for help. It's also an acclamation of praise because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in this world and for every one of us who has believed in him. So if you would with me, just lift your voice if you feel comfortable doing it and say Hosanna. Hosanna. Amen. Now, let me offer then, let me organize the rest of my thoughts today uh, like this. Let me offer three desperate thoughts. Three desperate thoughts. 
And the first one is desperation is normal. Desperation is normal. And I say that because, as you're well aware, desperation is part of the human condition. And uh, it's part of what Jesus came to fix. Henry Thoreau wrote famously that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. A stereotype but unconscious despair is concealed even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. In other words, the things even that we do to entertain ourselves are covering a fundamental despair. March Madness, crazy as it is, when all is said and done, is concealing something in us that's broken. I mean, that's an extrapolation from Thoreau's writings, but I understand what he means when he says, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, and even those things we attempt to do to take our minds off of the despair we feel is only concealing something that's fundamentally wrong in us. Thoreau's words are a sad and elegant condition, pardon me, description of the human condition. I must say, however, that when we believe in Jesus and come into relationship with God the Father, that the human condition fundamentally changes. I like the way St. Augustine got at this when he, he bridged the gap between fundamental desperation and the peace that we find when we come into relationship with God through Jesus when he said, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Our heart is restless until we f it finds its rest in thee. See, we were made for, for a relationship with God the Father. And if that relationship is broken, then we are prone to desperation. The prodigal son, as, as most of you know, was desperate when he came to himself and realized that all he ever wanted was in his father's house. What he needed to make things right was to get back into relationship with his father. Jesus said that when the prodigal son came to his senses, he said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And this realization, of course, was a gift. And it's likewise a gift when we realize that what we really want, what we really need is to return home to God. That what we need to, to, to satisfy our restless heart, to fix the desperation we feel, is to, through Jesus and what he did, come back into relationship with God the Father. Of course, the prodigal son came to his senses in a pig pen, but it's important not to stereotype the pig pen. We may think of the pig pen as, you know, kind of the gutter. Uh, perhaps, perhaps an addict, for instance, is so obviously shattered that he wakes up in a metaphorical pig pen and comes to understand that he is powerless over his addiction and he turns his life and will over to the care of God. And if someone does that, then that is a gift to realize that what they need to get healed is to come into a relationship with God, someone who can help us in a way that we cannot help ourselves, a power greater than ourselves. Uh, but as, as we all know, the, the gutter can be the corner office. Of course, the person in the corner office can be the addict, uh, but uh, uh, someone in a, in a gutter, perhaps with a better view, but a gutter nonetheless. My, my point is, at least in part, that we are all desperate, that we all, if we're honest, need to wake up to our condition and be honest like the prodigal son was. What I need can only be found when I come into relationship with God. 
And this is a gift that God gives us. And this desperation isn't just, you know, for the, for the person who you, you, you might look at that person and say, I can see that their life is broken. If we're honest, if we're honest before Christ, uh, uh, and, and in ways I may even describe after we come to Christ here in a few moments, there, there's a brokenness in each and every one of us. Um, Tim Keller wrote, a life not centered on God leads to emptiness. Building our lives on something besides God not only hurts us if we don't get the desires of our hearts, but also if we do. In other words, all these efforts we make to try to find whatever it is we're looking for, whether we find what it is we're chasing or are disappointed in what it is we're chasing, does not change the fundamental human condition. It's like um, uh, Cynthia Himmel in a Village Voice column uh, thought back on all the people that she knew in New York City before they became famous movie stars. She said that one worked behind the makeup counter at Macy's, one worked selling tickets at movie theaters, and so on. She wrote, when they became successful, every one of them became more angry, manic, unhappy, and unstable than they had been when they were working hard to get to the top. And why, Himmel writes, and I quote her now, that giant thing they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to fill them with happiness, had happened, and the next day they woke up and they were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. See, the fact is, without Christ, our basic human condition is fundamental brokenness, or as I'm saying it today, desperation. The fact is we all need saving. May, 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 may I say something kindly to, 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 to all of us in this room? We cannot receive the good news until we acknowledge the bad news. The bad news is we need the good news. We notice this word, need need the good news. The good news, of course, is, is that when you know that you need the good news and believe in the good news, you get the good news. And I'm of course, when I'm talking about the good news, I'm talking about the gospel, who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. So uh, one, one of the great uh, arguments uh, around this in Scripture is found in the first three chapters of Romans. And I'd encourage you to read the first three chapters of Romans with, with, uh, with, with, with this in mind. Paul is trying to make the argument to the Romans, you know, these people who lived in the center of the world at that time, that they needed what Jesus came to do, that they needed it. It wasn't like some optional nice little thing perhaps that they could have, but that they needed what Jesus came to do. And he says several things, including, you know, uh, uh, even nature itself reveals to us that there's a God and, and, uh, and, and we understand there's a distance between us and him. Uh, or we might say we understand we are fundamentally not measuring up to who he is. And, and then he, he says, again, I'm summarizing uh, uh, a, 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 a whole lot of stuff when I say this. He says, you, you, you can either know this because you've tried to follow God's law and haven't been able to, or because you've made your own law and haven't been able to keep the rules you made. And so he's saying basically to, 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 to the Jewish people, his brothers and sisters, you know, we were given God's law and none of us could keep it. We, we, we all fell short of it. But he said, but to, to the rest of you, to you Gentiles, even if you made your own rules up, none of you have been able to keep them all. I mean, let's be honest with each other, guys. We may say, you know, someone may say, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And, and, and I, I, on one hand, I don't want to argue that with you. I frequently will say to somebody, you're a good man, you're a good person. I understand that in kind of a generalized sense, but in a legal sense, standing before holy God, can I just say something to you? As hard as you may try to be a good person, you are not always a good person. Are you always a good person? I mean, let's just be honest with each other. No. I mean, I mean, set the most mundane of rules for yourself. I'm not going to eat that anymore. Have you kept the rule? 
I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to think this anymore. Have you stopped forever thinking that? I mean, make your rule, make whatever rule you want. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get angry about that anymore. Did you, uh, I, I'm tr- just trying to, t- here's what, in the, here's how Paul ends the argument at the end of Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody needs fixing. Everybody. So we can, you know, we, some folks think to be religious is to say, you know, I, I'm going I'm to try to be a good person. And, and, and I'm all for that. But guess what? Try as you may, you are not always going to be a good person. This is why you need Jesus. Because Jesus was the good person. The perfect man who did for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and he bridges the gap between our can't quite always get it together and God who has always had it together. Jesus bridges the gap. And so here's what the Apostle Paul said, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all this is the good news, are justified or made right with God freely by His grace that came through the redemption of Jesus Christ. And I, when I think about this, I can't help but remember a simple little conversation I had with a guy, but it's what I think about when I think about this passage. Playing uh, uh, basketball lunchtime at the Montclair YMCA, which I did for many, many years, and um, uh, there's a guy that, that played ball there a lot. We got to know each other pretty well, prosperous, uh, young businessman. And he would ask me questions about what I do and, and so on. And I remember one day standing there between games, you know, sweat pouring off of our brows and uh, standing at the drinking fountain getting a drink. And, 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 and he looked at me and said, you know, I really appreciate what you do. And I know he's trying to be sincere, but, but here's the patronizing statement he made. He said, I really appreciate what you do, though. Those people need saving. You're those people. You understand? He was talking about you. To which I say, you're exactly right. We people need saving, and his name was John. And John, so do you. You're just not graced enough at this moment to understand what it is you need because you need saving. Dear friends, Jesus came to save you, and the reason he came to save you is because you need saving. And so it's okay on Palm Sunday. It's okay on Palm Sunday to say, save me, like those people were praying on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. Here's my second thought. Desperate hope is the new normal. Desperate hope is the new normal. So when I, when I think about that crowd on Palm Sunday, I see desperate people. But at the same time, I see hopeful people. Desperate hope seems paradoxical. But I see desperate hope. Why? Why? Why is hope mixed in with their desperation? Because they were believers, at least to the extent they could be prior to Good Friday and Easter. They were believers. They believed that Jesus was their answer. They believed he was coming to fix things. When somebody sees Jesus as Savior, then desperation turns to anticipation. And anticipation is about hope. And my sense is that believers are no longer fundamentally desperate but desperately hopeful. We begin with fundamental desperation. We believe in Jesus. Jesus does what he does in our lives, and now we become desperately hopeful, even as we live in a broken world and still reap the consequences of our own brokenness. We believe that what Jesus set in motion on Holy Week through his death, burial, and resurrection gives us reason to hope now. And for the future, when we see things that are not as they should be, we know that what he did on Holy Week is still being worked out in our lives and through our world. We know that that salvation 
needs to be understood as something that happened, is happening, and will happen. Let me just spend a minute on this, kind of technical, but it's, it's actually important, I think, to get to a place of reality when we're thinking about what it means uh, for Jesus to have fixed us. I'm going to tell you, he fixed us, he's fixing us, he will fix us. The theologians would say it like this, that salvation needs to be understood in terms of definite, progressive, and final definite, progressive, and final, which is to say that when we first confessed our faith in Jesus, we were definitely saved. And therefore, it's perfectly appropriate for us to say we were saved. Such and such a day. I spontaneously, I don't do this often, but this morning after the first service, I just felt compelled to lead people in, a, in an opportunity to confess their faith in Jesus. And there were people in that room who for the first time in their lives confessed their faith in Jesus. And they'll be able to look back the rest of their life and say on Palm Sunday 2024, I was saved. But that doesn't mean that they still don't need saving. I mean, when someone first believes in Jesus, they are made right with God. They cannot be made any more right with God than they are at the moment that they first confess their faith. We are made right with God on the basis of our faith in Jesus and the grace God extends us. Boom, we are saved. Yet at the same time, we're being saved from our old selves, and from the world around us. It doesn't take away from the fact we were saved. Something fundamentally changes in us. We're born again. We're born again, and it's not just theoretically. We sense it. We feel it. We know it. It's real. We feel that weight of sin lifted from us and all that stuff. We were saved, but we're still being saved, and we know that this process isn't going to end until the day Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom on this planet when we can say we will be saved. We were saved. We're being saved. We are being saved. We could talk about justification. The moment I believed, I was justified. It's just as if I had never sinned. But now I'm being sanctified, which means now I'm actually learning to live this life the way Jesus taught us to live it, and I need his help to do it because there's something still broken, and I still need fixing. But I know that when all is said and done, He's going to, you know, the word is glor we're going to be glorified, justified, sanctified, glorified, definite, progressive, final. We were fixed. We're being fixed. We will be fixed. We were saved. We're being saved. We will be saved. But part of what happens then is we have, we have hope. We have hope because of what's already happened, and we have hope because of what we know is going to happen. And therefore, we're not just desperate. We're desperately hopeful. And there's a, there's a, the, the whole universe is experiencing this kind of desperate hope. It's, it's, uh, it's laid out in uh, Romans chapter 8 in a marvelous passage of Scripture where, where Paul wrote this. He wrote, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. He's acknowledging the fact that even though we've been saved, even though we've been made right with God, that there's still stuff in this broken world you know, that's not going to be completely resolved until, until the new age to come. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Now he's writing to people who he has already told are God's children. But he's saying there's a full revelation of that that's yet to come. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as adopted children. Hear, 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 this, hear this dichotomy that you kind of have to get for, this, for, you, for us to make sense of life, which is to say, we needed fixing. Jesus came in our life, and man, did he ever do something. Yet, there's a certain suffering and groaning that takes place, while at the same time, there's an eager hope on the fact that God's going to continue doing his thing in our lives and in this world, and things are going to continue to get better because of what Jesus came to do. And so, again, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us. Note the word as a foretaste, I'll come back to that, of future glory. For we 
Wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. So regardless of what's going on in our lives, we have, we're not just desperate. We're desperately hopeful because we've had a foretaste of future glory. And we know that what God started in us is continuing in us, and someday it's going to be completed in us. And I love this word foretaste. Why do we have eager hope even in the midst of suffering? Because we have a foretaste. If you would please say foretaste. Because we have a foretaste of future glory. Uh, you, you know, what, what is a foretaste? I mean, you, you, it speaks for itself, right? You, you, you get a taste of something, but you don't get the whole thing. You get a foretaste of it. It's like when our kids were little, Sharon would let them lick the, uh, the, the, the mixer thing when she was making a, a cake or the icing or whatever, right? And the, they, 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 they'd come around and she'd let them lick it. Well, the kids are all grown up now, by the way, but someone else gets to enjoy this. This is a text she sent to the family. Uh, my favorite child, uh, uh, Dietrich, uh, guess who gets to lick the spatula, she said, when you're not here. It's a foretaste. You know, you, you don't get the whole thing. You're not getting the whole cake, but you have, you have a sense of, of what the whole thing is going to taste like because you have a foretaste. And here's the deal, guys. We have a foretaste of future glory, and this is what we know. It tastes great. We know that what God has already done in our lives, the measure of peace we already have, the sense of forgiveness, the joy that we experience, even in the midst of a fallen and broken world where things in our lives are still being worked out. That foretaste is keeping us anticipating a future glory that's going to be better than anything we ever could have imagined. I, uh, years ago, Sharon and I uh, bought our first home in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, I keep pointing over here because my beautiful wife's sitting here on the front row. And um, uh, it's, it's, did I say probably 40 years ago, we, we had a home built. Sounds pretty extravagant, doesn't it? Uh, in, in a suburb of Indianapolis, Indiana, 1,300-square-foot uh, home on a cul-de-sac back in a little neighborhood. I wouldn't, so much time has passed that I'll, I'll tell you how long ago it was. We paid $78,000 for this home <laughs> to be built. All right? Crazy, I know. But that's how it all started. Nonetheless, first nice weather weekend of the summer, and by the way, that's not too far around the corner. Uh, first nice weather weekend of the summer you know, we have the home, but as we're driving, there's always something else you want, right? We're driving through the neighborhood, windows down, and I smell the smell of people barbecuing on their grills in their backyards, wafting through. You know, we'd always lived in apartments or whatever, so people didn't have grills. This is a new experience to me. The, the whole neighborhood smelled like a, 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 a hamburger cooking on the grill. And anticipation rises in my heart. And I, and, and I, and I said, Sharon, we, we've got to figure out how to go get a grill because I want to have hamburgers on the grill tonight. And, and so we went, you know, wherever, I don't know if Home Depot was around in those days, wherever we went, we went someplace. And uh, we, we, we picked out a grill, a beautiful grill sitting there, you know. And, and, uh, but when, they, when, they, when we checked out, they didn't give me that grill. They gave me a gigantic box. And, uh, you know, we lugged that box home and I put it in the garage and I said, Sharon, hey, why don't you go to the grocery store, get us some hamburgers. I'm going to put this th together real quick and uh, we're going we're gonna to have hamburgers tonight. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sm smelling this all over the neighborhood. I just can't hardly wait. I'm salivating at the thought. And uh, I open the box and I pull out one part and I pull out another part. I think there were like, I counted 3,343 parts 
And uh, I start putting this grill together. As you can imagine, we did not have hamburgers that night unless we ordered from McDonald's. And uh, neither did we have it, even though I worked most through the night. And the, all the next day, we didn't have it the next day either. Nor did we have it, though I worked, hardly slept the next night. But three days later, finally, it was like between the crucifixion and the resurrection. <laughs> finally, finally. Finally, there was a grill put together enough, enough, I say enough, because there were still parts that I had no idea where they would go. Uh, my last attempt, at, literally 40 years ago, to do something like that, when I risked my life and the lives of everyone in the neighborhood by lighting that gas grill. And finally, I got that. And why, why was I able to survive those three terrible, terrible days in my life? Because I had a foretaste. I had a foresmell, if you please. I could taste those hamburgers. And so help me, I was going to make it through and take whatever action I needed to take in order to get to that inevitable result. Well, sometimes when we're dealing with junk in our lives and trying to put things together and trying to make every things work, and we have to acknowledge there's still some groaning and some suffering and some difficult and some pain and some loss in this life. It's that foretaste of future glory that helps us not just to be desperate and say, save me, but to say, I have been saved, and now I'm desperately hopeful. I have a sense that God, who saved me, is going to do all the rest of his good works in my life. And here's my third and final thought. It's to say then that we must stay hopeful in desperate times. We must stay hopeful in desperate times. So the four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus slow down when they get to Holy Week. It's kind of interesting. Rarely does the biography of a great person uh, spend more than about 10% of its time uh, on, on the death of that person, even uh, uh, really important deaths like Dr. King's or Gandhi's. Uh, yet the, the, the Gospels slow down enough to give us a third, a third of their copy space, if you please, their pages on that last week. This is why part of why we get a sense of how important Holy Week is now from Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday. And the Gospels spend a third of their time telling the story of the last week of Jesus. And, and, and it occurs to me that to the people who lived that week, that it must have seemed like a lifetime. It must have seemed like forever. From Palm Sunday and the crowds surrounding him shouting Hosanna, until, you know, news came that he had been raised from the dead. And during that week, for those people who waved palm branches and shouted Hosanna on Palm Sunday, there were lots of reasons to lose hope. I wish I had time to get into all the things that happened that week, but we know the big event happened on Friday. You know, when, when th this person that, that they put all their hope in, dies the most excruciating and humiliating death known to humanity at that time. Here they had believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had come to make everything right in this world, and now he's dead. You can only imagine how these folks must have felt on Saturday. You know, and I, I kind of wonder, did, were, 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 were they embarrassed? Were they, I mean... Certainly, they were desperately sad. Again, you know, six days before, it's, you know, here he is. Here's the one. And now their hopes are crushed. And they, they didn't understand that Easter was coming. I mean, we do, but they, they, they didn't understand that. It looked like it was over, disappointed again. And my, my experience is that hope has to survive seasons like the week between Palm Sunday and the resurrection. Hope 
has to survive seasons like that. You have to be able to get sometimes from Palm Sunday through all the vicissitudes of life, the attacks of people and the evil one, the inexplicable losses, the pain. You have to get from Palm Sunday to Easter sometimes, and you have to be able to wave the palm branches even when the body is in the borrowed tomb. Can you... Can you keep hoping, even in desperate times? So we've moved from being fundamentally desperate to desperately hopeful, and then, you know, there are those times that challenge our hope. And and what we've learned, of course, what we know is we know that, but, but we have to remind ourselves of this, that God is often at work in those, during those times in ways that are necessary for him to bring the best possible outcome. I mean, what's going on on Saturday between Friday and Sunday morning? Well, he's entered death. He's in Hades. He's, he's battling against, and I'm going to teach about this on Friday night for a few minutes. He's battling against death itself. He had to do that in order to come out of the tomb the next day and, you know, dangle those keys of death and hell and say, you know, I, I, I did it. But the people living, you know, on this dimension of life couldn't understand it. And I think this is the reality that many of us experience. You know, what we're seeing, we don't have the ability to understand, you know, God's at work in ways that, that, that we can't even imagine. We have to keep our hope. We have to know that. Ultimately, we have to know because of the resurrection. God, in fact, can do and will do anything. We have to keep our hope. During those difficult times, how does someone keep their hope when everything that you hope for seems to have died an agonizing death? I uh, some some several years ago, just in my daily devotional readings, I read through the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. And if you're not familiar with the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, the, the the fact is, pardon me for saying it this way. At least this is my perspective when I read it several years ago. They're pretty depressing. I know I shouldn't, I'm a pastor, I shouldn't say that about reading something from the Bible, but just to be frank, pretty depressing. At least that's how it affected me. Uh, you know, Jeremiah is writing about how if the people, if the Jewish people don't repent, they're going to be sent into captivity and all these bad things are going to happen to another. And they didn't repent and they got sent into captivity. And then I think finally I finished the last thing of Jeremiah, thank goodness. And then of course the next book is Lamentations written by Jeremiah, who actually now is going to write about, lament, this new reality that these people find. But what Jeremiah knows is it's only going to last 70 years. God's working things out, and a new day is going to come. Now, he knows this, and he starts to weave this into the narrative in Lamentations. And I was particularly moved by Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19, where Jeremiah said, I remember my affliction and my wandering. He's not living in denial. He's not Pollyanna. He's not acting like everything's okay when everything isn't okay. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. I love it. I'm I remember there's some things happening that aren't good. I didn't want it to be this way, but it is. But what am I going to do? I'm going to hope because this is what I know. The sun's going to rise again. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, and therefore I'm not just desperate. I'm desperately hopeful. Kind of a maybe a... This is another memory that comes to me, and I'm wrapping this thing up. Another memory that comes to me when, I, when I'm thinking about that. and uh, It's a simple illustration, personal to me and Sharon, but I, I, I remember when I had to give, and I say had for reasons I'll explain, the invocation at the end-of-season banquet after the Yale-Harvard football game, the game in 2009. 
Our son Caleb was a junior playing tight end for Yale. It's the biggest game of the season, the, 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 the biggest game to that point in his life. It's on national television. There are 50 to 60,000 people in the crowd. They're playing Harvard. It's the game, the most uh, historic football game in, in college football. And um, they, they'd lost to Harvard the last two years, which is a big, 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 big thing. You have to hate Harvard. So I look at some of my Harvard friends. If you're a Yale person in any way, uh, it's a big deal. And they have the game won. It's over with a few seconds left. And the coach for Yale made literally the worst decision I've ever seen a coach make at any level of any sport in my life. And Harvard gets the ball back, a miracle play. They win the game. And it was, again, in relative terms, heartbreaking. And especially for those those boys. And three years in a row losing to Harvard, you may never recover from that the rest of your life. And it's national news because the coach, the, he blew this game in such a way that it became, it, it was national news for a few days. as like the worst coaching mistake in history. And these boys are sobbing on the field, these great big strong boys. And they're walking back in the tunnel and the coach who should have been encouraged them is banging his head against the concrete wall of the tunnel. And if I would have been there, I would have banged it for him. Well, the next day is the end of year banquet at, 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 for Yale, and I'm the first person to speak to this teary-eyed, hungover <laughs> football team and their parents who probably felt worse than they do because parents are sick about things like this, and I'm a parent. And, and, uh, and, 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 and when I get up, what came to my mind actually was this passage from Lamentations. And, and, and I said, in, you know, playing a really small role in a, in a larger story, I said, I, said I, I know that what happened was really bad. And I know that we all feel really terrible today. No sense in acting like what happened didn't happen. In fact, it did. But because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The sun will rise again. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. And somehow the report later was that folks were pretty encouraged by those, even uh, uh, Ivy League school folks were encouraged by those words from the prophet Lamentation. Now here's why I say that. I know that some of you today are facing things in your life a whole lot more real and a whole lot more devastating than losing a simple football game. I understand that. But I feel like saying to you on this Palm Sunday that it's okay to go ahead and believe regardless what you're experiencing. It's okay to live with a happy anticipation of the good. It's okay to wave palm branches and to say, save me and praise him at the same time. Because even in the midst of lamentation, there's reason to hope. Even on the Saturday after Good Friday, Day, there's reason to hope because the sun will rise again because Easter is coming and because if God could raise Jesus from the dead God can do anything and he can do anything for us and so we're hopeful even in desperate times